Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Midweek at the Compass, where we are furthering the conversations from our weekend services. You know, right now we're in a sermon series called Side by Side, where our senior pastor, Jeff Griffin, is walking through the book of Acts to study group life, small groups, healthy community. And to do a better conversation than I could have on my own, I feel like I should bring in the group life guy from our Naperville campus. So, Gerald Aloran, thank you. What's going on, man? Nothing much. Thanks for having me on. Um, glad to be here, and I'm excited to talk about this topic. Yeah, so let's just let people know a little bit about you. Uh, to me, there's several interesting things about Gerald. Uh, But one of my favorite interesting things is um, your background in being able to beat people up. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) What what actually do you do? Yeah, so I do uh, Muay Thai, uh, kickboxing, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which is a submission grappling form based out of Brazil. So how long have you done that for? Yeah, going on 10 years. All right. So uh, there's a belt system, I'm assuming? Yeah. As we speak... What's that looking like for you? Yeah, so I'm uh, probably a, a, a stone throws away from a, a professorship, which is a black belt. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying you're pretty good at this? I guess. So or other s- people affirm that I'm good at this. There, okay, yeah, that's yeah, fair. Yeah, yes, uh, yes. So do you think you could beat me up? The answer no, to that is yes. Yeah, probably, probably. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm wiry, you know, like yeah. I think that's my defining characteristic here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not powerful. That's okay. No. I'll you, leave that you to you. You run faster than me, though. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so. When I used to run, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the athletic days of Jake, I feel like, are a little bit in the rear view mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the you current, still look in shape, though. Hey! Yeah. Looks can be deceiving, but thank you. Yeah, but I'm in shape. Round is a shape. Round yeah. is yes. a shape. Yes. I'm going to leave that one completely yes. alone. But yes. let's focus on this power word. Yes, yes, uh, definitely. Do you have a pretty massive right hook? Yeah, um... I, because I'm a orthodox fighter, meaning my left hand's first and my right hand's back, I have a pretty good left hook. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, this is the worst transition in the world, <laughs> but we're going to move from your power grappling yes. uh, into the power of the Holy Spirit. So we see in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, verse 8, that it says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes yeah. upon you, and you will be my witnesses yeah. in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. Mm-hmm. And then we fast forward a little bit, and we see in chapter 2 of Acts, in verse 1, it starts by saying, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is the day of Pentecost. This is the start of the church, right? Yeah. But a lot of times, it can also be seen as the start of the charismatic church. And that's where I want to have this discussion today because you and I— our kindred spirits in this regard. Definitely. Because we have a background in what most people would consider a charismatic church. So I grew up in the Assembly of God Church, but this isn't about me. I'd love to hear a little (laughs) bit of your background. How did you end up in a charismatic church? Which denomination was it? Just give me a little bit of a background of how does Gerald end up from New York to where that led? Yeah. So... um, like a good Filipino family, I was uh, baptized and confirmed Roman Catholic, and I heard the gospel not there, but at a King James Fundamental Baptist Church. So these are traditions that are opposite of typical charismatic churches, but I wasn't really into the church world until I was about 20 years old and when I had a radical, salvific, Pauline-type experience, and my uncle at the time, because I didn't know where to go with this, because I had a dramatic spiritual experience, he took me to Brooklyn Tabernacle. And if you don't know what Brooklyn Tabernacle, look it up. Pastor Jim Cimbala, he wrote a few books like Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, Fresh Power. And um, I really w- hammered this fresh thing. Yes, it's, it's fresh. It's very <laughs> fresh. And um, he took me to Brooklyn Tabernacle, and it was there that I really saw the if you will want to use that word, the power of God 
um, really just show itself in some of the most um, uh, unnatural ways that I'm used to seeing God work in. And so that really shaped my experience. From there, um, I went to the Chicagoland area to pastor at an Assemblies of God Church on the north side of Chicago, which continued my um, uh, uh, charismatic experience. While I was going to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School for seminary, after that, I went to a Methodist church, uh, which, by the way, if you didn't know, Methodism uh, was probably the forerunner to the Pentecostal movement. Uh, the Holiness Methodist uh, Wesleyan uh, movements were forerunners. And then from there, uh, Foursquare. Um, yep, Foursquare Church. Uh, I planted uh, a Methodist church. And here I am today at an evangelical free church, which is not charismatic. No, not exactly. No. Not uh, really, yeah. Still believe in the power of the Holy Spirit yes, and everything that yes. comes with it. But I would love to know just... It seems like you almost kind of fell into the charismatic church. Yeah. And you just kind of briefly mentioned you saw things that seemed unnatural, right? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times that's where people go. Um, for me personally, it was always kind of down to two things that I could never explain. Um, and it was speaking in tongues and healings that I saw. Um, but I'm wondering just kind of your experience. What are what are some of the things you experienced through yeah. the Assembly of God, Foursquare, Methodist church background that you had? Yeah. Um, what are the things that you saw? What were the things that made you comfortable or uncomfortable? Um, let's just kind of talk a little bit yeah. of what that looked like. Yeah, just to... Just to kind of give a little framing to it. Um, when, I, when I think charismatic, I think um, um, something that can not be naturally explained, right? It's, you know, you'll have psychological explanation, biological explanation. You could have all these expl explanations, um, but at the root of some of the experiences that I have, I, I you know, you might find other explanations, but um, I, I tend to lean towards, yeah, that, that, that's a work of God that I that is not usually part of the natural order. And so uh, some of the experience, uh, for example, my um, conversion experience was uh, a vision. I had a vision where God radically um, appeared to me, um, spoke to me, where I heard an audible voice. Um, and from that moment, I also received, if you will, my calling to ministry. Um, and from there, my uncle brought me to Brooklyn Tabernacle, where I saw uh, uh, people from the streets, prostitutes from, you know, as part of Bushwick, Brooklyn at the time. Now they're in downtown Brooklyn. And um, they were uh, pimps, prostitutes, gang members were brought into this church. And I remember on a Tuesday night prayer meeting, that's what they were known for. Their Tuesday night sometimes were more packed than their Sunday mornings. And their Tuesday night prayer meetings, they would like the church members would bring in these people and these people that were brought in from the street they would be coming and screaming and and like crying and i would see the leaders of the church surround them and pray for them and it, you know it was explained to me later on they were experiencing like demonic oppression and their way their things were being um physically manifested through screaming and crying and the leaders were praying for them and I see these same people who came in screaming and crying being laid on hands and being prayed for later on are now serving in the church and inviting their friends into the church those are the types of things I saw I saw healings I saw um, I, uh, I saw things where where people were uh, praying over people specific things in their lives that no one else would know where's what is this? Where is this coming from? And so those are some of the uh, things that I saw, some of the things that I've experienced, which till this day, I mean, there might be the possibility of, of happenstance that some biological reason these things happen, maybe some psychological reasons. But at the end of the day, there was some transformation and long-lasting fruit that made me believe, hey, this is a work of God that can't be explained naturally. Yeah, I, I've got kind of a similar story, right? Like I was born and raised in an Assembly of God church. 
I just didn't know any different. Um, to me, what we did for church was just what church looked like. Um, I didn't have any other frame of reference. Um, so I would see people speaking in tongues and then didn't really think anything of it. Um, I would see healings happen, and um, I don't want to say it was commonplace by any stretch of the imagination, but to me it was just, yeah, yeah. this is the work and the power of the Holy Spirit yeah. in somebody's life. Um, they are coming to yeah. saving faith in Jesus, believing in God because of all of those yeah. things. And it's like, this is good yeah. news. It, it was normal. Uh, it's like Sunday morning coffee and healings. It was just part of the part Maybe of the not that normal, but <laughs> not too far off, right? Yeah. Um, but it was the same thing that happened to me. And that's where it got a little bit harder to explain personally. Um, I can look back now and see the goodness of God. Um, but I was having problems with my wrist and I was a tennis player at the time. Um, and I wanted to be able to keep playing and it was just for selfish reasons. And I remember being at a youth convention. They asked people to come down front if you need a prayer for healing. I went down front. Um, a guy that ultimately ended up marrying my wife and I uh, was down there and asked me what I needed prayer for. And I remember a warm sensation on my wrist and waking up the next morning and having no pain, which allowed me to play tennis, which got me to Elmhurst College yeah. then, now Elmhurst University, mm -hmm. where I met my wife the second day of freshman orientation. We got married. We moved to the western suburbs. I meet a man named Rich Sanford who leads me and disciples me, and ultimately I'm in ministry, right? Like, wow. I can start to connect all of these dots. Mm -hmm. But it's also something where I've never had a very easy time talking yeah. about all of it. Yeah. Um, because being outside of a charismatic church now, um, people kind of look at you a little bit funny when you yeah. say you have those experiences and backgrounds. And it's just something that's a little hard to quantify for them. Yeah. It's a little hard to explain or grasp um, or to wrestle with this is very likely of God, you know, not all the time. Exactly. I don't think it's always healthy. Yeah. Um, but there are aspects of it that I really think are and were in my life. Um, that it's just, it's been harder to reconcile the farther past that, that I've gotten. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if you have a, yeah. a similar experience there yeah, you or not. know, and, and being removed from that environment, you know, I kind of look back and, and maybe I'm a little more cynical now, but I, I can't help but think, you know, God was at work hmm. in those moments. Um, you know, sometimes when you preach or I preach or I teach, we might have certain motives behind it that we're unaware of. But the word of God is the word of God, right? And, yeah. and and maybe at the times when these charismatic spiritual things were happening, maybe the people who were being used by God to do these things, they might have had ulterior motives, right? But at the end of the day, God was still moving in ways that have long-lasting fruit, kingdom fruit. Um, um, and so I, I, you know, I'm more of an optimist in that sense, like. You know, there might have been some, uh, you know, not the best uh, uh, reasons for them doing it, but still God used it in mighty and powerful ways. And I still, till this day, can't, I, I can't explain it away. I can't explain it away. Yeah. And I think I'm in the same boat. That's where I land yeah. a lot of times on it yeah. is I can't explain yeah. what I experienced in any other way except for that it's the power of the Holy Spirit at work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times when you talk about charismatic church, people think that there's like just this huge negative reason why somebody would have walked away from it or ultimately moved on from it. Um, but as you and I were talking, it seems like actually neither of us have that experience. Yeah. So I'd be curious, what was it for you um, that led you from, you know, AG, Foursquare, Methodist Church, uh, to working for an e-free church, <laughs> evangelical free church yeah. of America, yeah. um, who doesn't necessarily shun charismatic beliefs. It holds a very open hand yeah. and allows people to kind of believe which ends of that they would choose yeah. to. But how did you get from there to saying, I need to either step away or was it just a job calling or what did yeah. that look like for you? Yeah, You know, I, I would say um, my charismatic Pentecostal experience uh, played very minimally in transitioning here. I think a lot of the circumstances surrounding what was happening in the Methodist Church at the time, the transition to come here to be closer to uh, my wife's parents, my in-laws, uh, being 
in a rural area to to realizing okay we lived in a rural area long enough i think it's time for us to transition um i think a lot the factors are more that than the charismatic experiences that i've had um so i i would say my transition wasn't any hurt or any blame on the charismatic experiences but um i think the charismatic experience made me a better pastor in my opinion in a more non-charismatic space. So before I'd say my story a little bit, elaborate on that last point. How did your experience in a charismatic church, how do you feel like that made you a better pastor? You know, without <laughs> without getting too, ooh, right? Sure. Uh, you know, I started off at the Bolingbrook campus, and um, uh, one of the first things that I've noticed is um, uh, there's a homeless population. There are people who walked into the buildings um, just from the street often, whether it was looking for some sort of aid or some sort of help. And what, what's interesting is there, there were quite a few times where people were looking for spiritual help. And in those cases, um, sometimes the people were in need of uh, some serious uh, therapy. But in other cases, these were normal, everyday people who were really seeking answers to some of the evil spiritual experiences that they've been having, whether it was dreams or voices. And, you know, my natural tendency is to say, hey, let's, we have some counseling references that I could refer you to. But in these cases, as we were praying together, um, I was really feeling and sensing, and it's hard to really put words to it, right? But I was discerning that this was more than psychological things that I was encountering. And I've dealt with uh, many people who are dealing with psychological issues. And, you know, here at the Compass Church, we have a lot of resources for that. We have care pastors. We have support groups, right? And this was not it. This was something definitely much more uh, spiritual in nature. And the spiritual charismatic background that I had, it, I, it wasn't an everyday thing, but it was something that we've experienced and we handled on a semi-regular basis. And so these people coming in looking for spiritual help, uh, my natural tendency now is that, oh, I could discern that this is something more spiritual than it is psychological. And we could begin the framework of leading them in certain prayers and beginning to expose the spiritual nature of what is really happening. What are these voices? What are the, the feelings that you're getting? Where's these identity issues coming from? Because the Lord loves you, but why are you feeling not love? So that's obviously not a psychological issue there's something spiritual there going on, right? And so, yeah, so it, it's helped me a lot. It's helped me a lot, those experiences. Yeah. yeah, so from my end, right, it wasn't an unhealthy thing for leaving that background necessarily either. Um, but it came down to really just two points. Um, the first is I met a beautiful woman who yeah. I am now married to. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, maybe does your let's, wife know? <laughs> <laughs> let's clarify that. Hi, yeah. Andrea, I love you. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, as we were sitting there and getting ready to get married, we were having conversations of what kind of church would make the most sense for us to where was we she would... part of that movement as well? No, so she oh, grew okay. up in okay. Evangelical Free Church okay. uh, in Chicago. Okay more or less Chicago, uh, okay. Norwich, Bethel is yeah. the name of it because every church is named Bethel, yes, right? right. Uh, but either way, um, that's not why we even landed at an E-free church. But just as we were dating and getting ready to get married and newlyweds, we had to have some very real conversations of what kinds of churches mm. would we both feel like we could be led and discipled in well, that we would be willing to invest our time and our energy in as well. Um, and just overall, I, I didn't get the sense and I didn't have peace of mind that something from a super charismatic end uh, was going to be the best fit for both of yeah. us starting a new life together. Um, that was the primary driver. And just kind of the secondary one, um, to me, the breaking point was never the the sign gifts. Mm -hmm. It was never, you know, speaking in tongues, prophetic words, healing, any of that that caused me pause. Um, the thing that I actually had to wrestle through the most coming out, um, and that led me to have just a little bit more comfort um, kind of leaving that specific denomination and moving to where we are now, uh, is really just I see the Holy Spirit and God overall uh, as a God who brings order out of chaos. Mm -hmm. And just my personal experience had always been more um, the Holy Spirit is spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just had a very hard time reconciling those two things where I see, you know, in Genesis 1 account that the Holy Spirit's hovering over the 
face of the waters, right? And is helping bring forth what we see and bringing order from darkness and chaos um, to then saying, no, it's all just, how is the spirit leading? Whatever that is, it's the direction we need to go. Um, I think the really healthy answer is probably a lot of times both and. Uh, We need to have the space to allow for that. But I think on our end, we should also plan and prep and prepare as well as we can. Um, So that's my personal soapbox for it. Uh, But ultimately, I feel like you and I are in a little bit of a unique position as well. Um, Because I would agree that charismatic backgrounds, there's a reason that a lot of worship leaders, I feel like, come out of that background and are amazing at what they do. Um, I think a lot of pastors that you know, have stage presence. A lot of times I wonder, did you come out of the same church that I did? Uh, But beyond that, we have the unique experience of having our view of the Holy Spirit being shaped from two different ends Mm -hmm. of the same string. Sure. Why not? Let's use that metaphor. It's not even a real metaphor, but I just made it up and we're going to run with it. Um, So how does your background in a charismatic church and now in the E-Free Church, how has that shaped your view of the Holy Spirit and who he is and what he does? Yeah, yeah. You you know, just piggybacking off what you kind of said, because, you you know, you you see worship leaders who come out of that, or you're like, oh, they came from where I came from. I think distinctly different, um, besides theological beliefs and experiences, is this idea that um, God is not merely a um, intellectual ascent to achieve right god is an emotional god who who uses things like love and the warm and the fuzzies and the 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 person the personal god that's next to you the god who cares for you and loves you in in the way that a father and a mother would care for their child and the feelings that their child gets when the father hugs them or the mom hugs them. There's something about that that I believe charismatic churches like really have, has sometimes a good, healthy, emotional side of it that really helps um, how we experience our Father in Heaven. You know, and when I look in Scripture, um, really I see um, our Father in Heaven, Jesus Christ, show lots of emotions, right? This is a, a, a God who works and functions in an emo, in a realm that uses emotions. Um, you see anger, you see love, you see joy, you see dancing, you see emotions play out. Um, but going to seminary really has helped uh, shape or even um, uh, shape in a direction about, about and have a little more clarity about who and what the Holy Spirit is. And I don't think it contradicted my, my seminary experience didn't contradict anything that I've experienced in the Holy Spirit. You know, if it, actually it, it kind of solidified some of the things. And it also helped me put guardrails to kind of say, you know what? I can't explain this, but this could be the Holy Spirit. There's nothing, any, there's not anything anti-biblical to it. It might be extra biblical, but it's not anti-biblical. But at the same time, I could distinctly say, that's definitely not of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so... Um, and you know that because it contradicts Scripture. It contradicts Scripture. It contradicts the trajectory of Scripture. It contradicts the nature of who God is and how I believe the Holy Spirit functions in our day and age. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and from my end, I like to think a lot of times that I have maybe more of an in-tune personality to realize that the Holy Spirit gives you power that you could have never had on your own. Um, you know, there's a reason Jesus said that it was better that I'm leaving. We're like a lot of times we think if Jesus was right there next to us, I would never dot, dot, dot. Or yeah. I would choose to go speak to somebody about how great he is because he's right, he's right beside me. Yeah. Uh, but he's saying it's actually better that I'm going because yeah. I'm sending you that helper yeah. to be able to do that with power, right? Yeah. We, Acts chapter 1, verse yeah. 8, you'll receive power to do immeasurably more in the church, right? We see that. And to me, that's where I've had my experience lead a little bit, right? Um, My view of the Holy Spirit is hopefully biblical first (laughs) and foremost. Um, But beyond that, it's the soapbox a little bit of you have power. The moment that you've accepted Christ and the work that he's done for you, Mm -hmm. you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. 
And because of that, you can do things that you would have never been able to yeah, do on your own. Correct. Um, and we see that day in and day out. It might be in some grand proclamation, or it might be in how you love your kids in a moment that's difficult. Yeah. Which is also powerful. Right? Without question. Which is also powerful, right? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me a little bit. What is, as we wrap up, sure. what's something that we can do to be more in tune with the Holy Spirit, yeah. right? A lot of times, personally, I'm going to own, um, I try and separate it a little <laughs> bit, uh, and we'll call, let's say it's baggage, but it's not even that. Um, it really is just, I've tried to rationalize a lot of things yeah. over the course of years to where I would have said fully power of Holy Spirit at one point in time, but now I move to the other end of how can I logically explain this? Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is the Holy Spirit is still present and active so what have you found helpful? How can you be a little bit more aware of what's happening yeah, yeah, yeah. from that end? You know, it's interesting. In our culture, there's this uh, uh, innate uh, kind of um, addiction to busyness and hurry, right? And even in the spiritual disciplines, we like, all right, let's, we got to pray, all right? We got to uh, memorize. We got to go to church. We got to do a small group. We got to get, those are all great things, right? But in a, a culture that idolizes busy and hurriness, if we get those checklists fast enough, we think we've kind of achieved something, right? When in actuality, it's it's we're achieving the opposite. Sometimes it's it's we're rushing our spirituality, and although you might be getting things, you're not actually uh, relying on the spirit for growth. You can, I kind of look at it as a, a slow cooker, right? You put all the ingredients in the pot, and you just kind of turn it on low. And it's not going to be five minutes. It's not going to be 10 minutes. It's going to be like four hours, eight hours even, depending on what type of meal that you're trying to uh, create. And I think, so some of the first step is, hey, slow down. <laughs> Stop. Sometimes people, the Holy Spirit is speaking. We're just so busy and we're so addicted to hurry and, and, and movement that we can't even hear the Holy Spirit. You see when God was speaking to Elijah, right, um, the idea of there was grand things happening, earthquakes, thunder, lightning, but that wasn't the Holy Spirit. It was the still, small voice. So kind of some first steps. Hey, slow down. As you're praying, as you're reading, don't put a time limit to it. Just be. And then and, and listen. You'll be shocked at the things you can start to hear. Um, another thing which might be, uh, um, uh, which might be crazy, as you're slowing down, um, and praying, and praying especially for people, hey, the Lord might impress on your heart through the Holy Spirit. Hey, you know, your neighbor, you've been talking to him for two years, three years, four years, and maybe he's asking you to invite him to a church service, right? That could be a small step. You know, we have Christmas cards. Oh, sorry. We have cards uh, to, uh, to use that we could invite people to. Uh, our services and all our services around our different campuses. Um, or maybe it's just to pray for somebody on a weekend worship services. Uh, maybe pray for someone in the atrium just walking around. Maybe just, just praying for someone on the street that you, you see and recognize. Some of these small steps might seem really big, but really, I mean, these are like small steps to listening to the Holy Spirit and actually being obedient to God. Yeah. Yeah, uh, man. That hits home with the busyness factor. Yeah. I'd still say the best book I've read over the last four or five years is The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, but John Mark Comer yep. um, focuses a lot on that. Highly recommend it if you haven't read that book yet and you struggle with just being too busy or needing too many things. Um, it was super, yeah. super powerful Great and convicting book. for me. Great book. Um, so yeah. it gets the Jake McNamara stamp of, of approval if that actually means anything. Well, here you go. But man, thank you for being willing yeah. to do this. Yeah. Um, we have really fun backgrounds that we don't actually get the chance to talk about yeah. all that much. <laughs> uh, but it's great to be able to do this yeah, and let all of you in behind the curtains a little yeah. bit. So speaking of being let behind the curtain, next week we're going to have Ian Shepard on, and he's going to let you know a little bit of the creative process that happens associated with our weekend services. Specifically, what do we do for pitching songs? How does it tie into the message? What are some thoughts uh, that you can glean from the work and the prep that happens to maybe better experience our weekend services together as well? So you're going to want to make sure to join back next time. I'm excited on... for that too. Hey, oh man! I mean, Ian's a good guy. And yeah. quite frankly, Ian has like the best laugh of anybody on 
Johnny yes. Depp. Um, yes. So I'm going to do my best to Make crack a joke Make him laugh. that makes him laugh so you can experience that yes. together. But we'll see you next time here, midweek at the Compass.